this has been adoption month and everyone has been able to share, you know, incredible story. And like we said, my daughter just adopted uh, two beautiful little girls and uh, this is their third adopted child. And everyone thinks that maybe that's is where the spirit of adoption came upon us. But I'm, I have a story for you. And I, I, unfortunately, um, uh, I'm gonna have to go quick. And, I, and there's so many players in this. But I brought pictures because the story is so complicated. <laughs> I, need, I need the help of the pictures. So um, I had uh, a sister who, uh, unfortunately, tragically, she died some years ago. She and her husband, Dr. Steve Graham, were in a tragic head-on car collision. And they, they died instantly. And so you figure she left three children behind. Um, but her story continues. It, and it continues, I think, by the Spirit of God. And it's t- it touches many. My sister, when she was a teenager... And living at home, going to school, she got pregnant. Oh, and here she is. That's Norma Jean. I called her Jeannie because I couldn't say Norma. I was seven years, eight years, seven or eight years younger. Um, Jeannie, Norma, was, uh, they, we, we attended church. I mean, we were a Christian family. And guess what? Stuff like this happens. And back in that day, it was very difficult for, uh, you know, she had no means of income. She was going to school, trying to finish her education. My father was an elder in the church, and I remember the anguish on my father's face. That this was his little girl. And now he's got to do something. So I know that he prayed and prayed and asked the Lord to give an answer. And so they came up with that she was going to leave the house for a few months to move to Tampa, have the baby, and she decided to give the baby up for adoption. And you can imagine the anguish that that would not just bring for a few months, but actually for my sister the rest of her life, because she cried, she says, every day. She would think about her baby girl. She had a little girl. So she has this little baby and she gave it up for adoption. I don't know if she had the opportunity to pick a family to place this child with, but she had no means to support it. She was out of her league and she did the hard thing. Obeying my father and my father thought he was obeying what the Lord had led him to do. Well, some years passed, quite a few years passed and my brother, how many of you have had that ancestry and me test where you spit in a bottle? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not very dignified. I got the DNA test. It starts with, you know. So he gets back. He gets back, you know, that we're this and that and blah, blah, blah. And so there was a couple of things in there that we didn't know. We didn't know where East African came from. It was my mother or my father. We didn't know where the Jewish thing came from. It was my mother and my father. My brother had my mother spit in the bottle and we figured all that out. So my brother who lives in Philadelphia, he gets a letter from this woman named Julie. She goes, I took the ancestry test too and they've contacted me and they said that our DNA is very, very close that we are related do you have a sister named Norma? And he goes, I did. She was in a tragic... She goes, I found, I knew the name Norma because I went to my parents' safe and when they passed, well, I think it was before they passed, and found the name Norma and the, the adoption papers. So they were like, Whoa. It is Julie. Now here's what's, it, it, oh, it's not over. My sister had three children. She had two boys, Stevie, Eric, 
And she said she's going to replace that little girl that she gave up. Guess what her name is? Julie. Guess what both Julies are? They're both nurses. I mean, we're just like, our brains are going, oh, this is so weird. Adopted Julie was an only child to an older couple who loved her, who raised her. I think he was in, I don't know what, he was in insurance, but she grew up in Homosassa Springs and she said that she had wonderful parents who loved her, cared for her, provided for her. She didn't miss anything, but she knew she always wanted to meet her birthing mother. And so she always looked. Anytime she saw the name Norma, Julie... Number two, <laughs> this, is my, this is my niece, Julie, and my other niece, Julie. <laughs> she had two older brothers who used to beat on her. I mean, in brotherly love, that's what we do. And she would always tell her mother, she goes, Mom, I wish I had a sister. I want a sister. I want to have a sister. How do you think that made my sister feel? She'd cry. So, Julie number two found in my sister's Bible the adoption certificate papers that my sister kept in there and prayed for her first baby. So, Julie calls my brother. He said, well, why don't you go, why don't you go to Orlando and meet your grandmother? like what that's Julie Julie and grandma (laughs) this is an incredible story that grows because Julie the first Julie she has one daughter Madison and she wanted Madison to have cousins that are her age to grow up, wanted family. She goes, when I'm gone, I want Madison to have family to hold on to. And then all of a sudden, crashes through the door. Guess what? She has family. I don't know, where's the pointer? Oh, that, no, that went the wrong way. All right. There is Madison. The other three are Julie's daughters. They are best of friends. They get together. They live in different parts of the country. They have become best friends. And she says, all my dreams, I have cousins my age. They get together. Julie and Julie talk talk or text every day or every other day. They are best friends. They both have discovered a sister that was in their heart. And it's interesting that... Their dreams came true because of hard decisions and crying out to God. Now, my sister and her husband didn't get to see this, but they're in heaven. It doesn't matter even, they are still writing their story. Their their testimony is still going on. What they did changing lives Sarah is a ballet my daughter is a ballerina she teaches here at school of dance well it didn't start there when I was a young child I had to be hauled off every afternoon to attend ballet classes that my sister was taking and you would think that I would so reject it that when my daughter became a ballerina I would say, absolutely not. My sister left behind her toe shoes. And Madison, Julie number one's daughter, is a ballerina. Julie number two gave these, her mother's toe shoes to Madison, her niece. From being 
very small family, this is what she discovered. That's, that's my family. They're in there all mixed up with Grams and Evans and Boutons. And, but they have a family now. That's adoption. See, I'm, I, if for anybody who's a Christian, you're adopted. You have been adopted by Christ into a family. That's exactly what happened here in this realm. In a spiritual realm, we have all been adopted. Do you know how big our family is? It is, you know, usually you see these movies. Remember the movies? And it was always the adopted kid who poisoned the well. You know, it's like little Timmy, the adopted one, he poisoned the family. You know, adoption for some reason has gotten a, a, a bad name. But I want you to know we are all adopted. What an incredible story that comes out from a hard decision, crying out to God, asking the Holy Spirit to lead. And you're not sure. But Julie number two, when she was sending me these pictures, ended a little note she, she had sent me. says, it's just such an incredible story all around and every time I think about it, I'm in awe of the way God wove our story together over so many years. I'm so thankful every day to have found the sister I never thought I would meet. In a way, she brought a piece of my mom back to me Just that just makes our family feel whole even though mom and dad are gone. You cannot tell me that the Holy Spirit is limited in time, is limited to our lifespan. That things that we do now, even when we're gone, are going to change people's lives. And so that brings me to the subject today, and I'm gonna, we're going to try to get through it. The subject today is our story continues. As Pastor Peter said last week, the scripture says that we overcome the enemy, we overcome the devil by the blood that Jesus shed and our testimony about the effectiveness of that blood on our lives. The word of your testimony, your story, that we are to share our story. And said, and I think the church is struggling because they, they don't think they have a story. I know my, my wife, she has a testimony. We've been in the faith for years and you have kids and all this stuff. But when we first were married, I had a testimony. And, and this happens so many times. You, know, you, ask, you, you would ask Crystal, what's your testimony? You know, he's like, well, I was, you know, I was slow, you know, sold into slavery and, you know, an uh, angel. No, hers was, well, my parents were missionaries. We lived in Costa Rica. We lived with the Indians in Canada. Uh, then my dad became a United Methodist preacher. And uh, when I was 16, I think I smoked a menthol cigarette. I repented and my whole life changed. <laughs> And so, but do you know how many of you have testimonies like that? And you go, eh, I can't give my testimony. You're giving away the very power that God said overcomes the enemy. But if my testimony is that, guess what? Your testimony is never to stop. Your testimony is not to stop. But so many of us, you know, well, now... You know, all my friends are Christians. You know, I go to work, I come home, I eat. I go to work, I come home, I eat. You know, I wave to a neighbor. I have no room, no place to grow a testimony. That's not true. And here's how you, that, that testimony grows. And said in 2 Corinthians, says, you show that you are a letter from Christ. A letter that's still being written. Your story is still being added on to, but there's something that so many believers have stepped back and away from, which we'll get to, that, that helps us to grow that story. The result 
of our ministry written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. You see, your story is someone else's story. So who was it that led you to the Lord? Who was the one who shared Christ with you? Said, you're, you're a part of their story, and guess what? You're a part of someone else's story. The people that you share the Lord with, the people that you have given to and helped. It's a letter that's continually being written. Well, and, and, and that story, like I said, like with my sister and my father, their story is affecting others. And even though they're not here, their story goes on. Changing lives. Nothing works without the Holy Spirit. And uh, this is a quick, quick run through. Said, no one can be saved without the Holy Spirit. Said, it's the Holy Spirit that gets you to that point. You know, you know you, people say, well, I remember when I accepted the Lord. You know, it's like, you know what? You just gave in because the Holy Spirit was twisting your arm. The Holy Spirit comes upon you and said, you cannot be saved without that act of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, back in the day when the charismatic renewal, you know, everyone's going, well, I got the Holy Spirit. I do this. I have these gifts, you know. And th there would be this argument between the charismatics and the Baptists. You know, Baptists say, you know, once saved, always saved. You know, you can't be saved without the Holy Spirit. They're right. But they would deny any present activeness of the Holy Spirit in their life. Then the charismatic says, well, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. You go, no, because Paul says in Corinthians says, I wish all of you did, but yeah, you, you don't, you know, good luck. You know, <laughs> he didn't say you had to. He goes, I just wish that you did. I just wish you did. If you don't, you don't. There's a balance. Why everyone has to have this extreme, I don't know. He said, <clears throat> Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water that their life has been cleansed by the blood of Christ and the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom and that without him, you will live lives of absolute foolishness. You're, people say, well, you know, I know guys who are really smart and they don't accept God. That's the thing called grace. God gives wisdom to those who ask, even if they're saved or not. But with the Holy Spirit, we have a claim. No one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. I want you to you know, say, wait a minute, I've had people say Jesus is Lord and I know there are losses of all in tall weeds. <laughs> but wait a minute, you know what that says? Instead of trying to convince them that they're not saved, you, that, that's your open door to know that the Holy Spirit is working in them because only by the Holy Spirit they could say that. That means the Holy Spirit is, is working on that person. That should encourage us. Go, for, listen, you obviously, the Holy Spirit's dealing with you because you can't say that unless the Holy Spirit is on you. Like, whoo. Instead, there's some who want to argue. You can't say that. You're not a man of God. Every believer is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Did you know that if you're a believer, God has given you a gift? But there are so many people who haven't embraced this Holy Spirit. You don't know what your gift is. When I, when I go to small groups and, and I say, okay, everyone's been given a gift. Every one of you, if you're a believer, God has, been, has given you a gift. What's your gift? Crickets. Crickets, crickets. I've been given a gift. Yeah, discover it. Discover it. Great, I got one minute. Here's what I understand. And it's so true that you haven't, 
And or many people have not discovered what their gifting is. And, and they don't recognize when the Holy Spirit comes to them and gives them an opportunity to discover your gift. Been doing this a long time. So someone in, in the church, in any church, they've been there five, ten years. And they come, come to the pastor and they say, you know, we believe the Lord's called us to go to another church because this church doesn't provide such and such. You don't teach such and such. This spirit of whatever is not here. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, then why have you not got off your Ebenezer? See, I could have said a bad word. (laughs) And met the need in the church. Oh, that might... You might need to be discovering your gifting. If you can recognize that it's lacking, then something is telling you to grow in that, to meet the needs of others. Stop meeting your own need. Well, I'm just not getting fed. I'm gonna take my Ebenezer and go to the next church and set my Ebenezer down so you can continue to feed me. Where do you find in the Bible that it's about selfishness? You don't. You don't grow a testimony doing that. You grow a testimony by putting yourself out there to grow in your gifting and offer that gift to meet the needs of others in church. You know, every spiritual gift that you find in the Bible, not one of them is for you. An orange tree grows fruit and does not eat oranges. What makes you think that God has called you to grow fruit to feed you? He has called you to feed the needs of others in the church. To do that, we need the Holy Spirit. We need to call upon the Holy Spirit. See, the, 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 one of the reasons I think this lacks is in, back in the 70s, there was this charismatic renewal and it was every Holy Spirit, this Holy Spirit, Holy, everything was the Holy Spirit. We prayed to the Holy Spirit. We looked for the Holy Spirit. I mean, and then people say, well, you know, everyone knows about the Holy Spirit and they stopped teaching about the Holy Spirit. And that's my concern that today, because all the old people know so much about the Holy Spirit, we haven't passed it on because, well, we know everything about the Holy Spirit. That's all we ever talked about and we're sick of talking about it. I love it when you people come up to me going, hey, I remember you teaching on that. I go, you're kidding me. So I've taught on it six times and you only remember one. (laughs) We need to bring the next generation up with us. So we're gonna talk about that. I'm gonna give you the opportunity to do what we find in the scriptures about writing to be a, a writing our story, telling our story, an ongoing story that's being written right now if you are in the right position and the right mindset. I just want you to know that one of the spiritual gifts is not finding fault with Jesus' bride. How dare you? I'm gonna complain about Jesus' bride, the church. He's jealous of his bride. And the Bible says he doesn't see fault with it. He feeds it. He feeds his bride. Instead of finding fault. It gets better. You can start to let your toes back out. I've stepped on all that I'm going to. Let me just get through this. Our time's getting on. Nothing works without the Holy Spirit and that includes your testimony. You can't grow it. It's powerless without the recognition that the Holy Spirit has has started it, who's dealing with it, is going to finish it. No spirit, no resurrection, no spirit, no new birth, no spirit, 
no confession of the Lordship of Christ, no spirit, no victory of sin, no progress in sanctification, no spiritual wisdom, and I add to no testimony. Let me share this with you. This is what Jesus says before he leaves. Jesus was a part, he practiced the law of navigation. He told the disciples what's going on. He kept telling them, going, guys, I'm going away. I'm going away. I'm going away. Here's what's going to happen when I go away. Here's what to look for when I go. It's a spirit of, of navigation, the law of navigation. Tell them what they're going to see. They may not comprehend it right now. How many times did your mother tell you, don't marry him? And you married him. Well, the law of navigation. She said, don't marry him. <laughs> so Jesus says to them, and I will ask the Father... And he will give you another, another advocate, another one, one that looks like me, one that sounds like me, and he's, what, he's just going to talk about things about me. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to send you another one. He is going to tell you all the things that I've already told you and more to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it is neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and you will be in him. Now, I want you to know that in the Old Testament, when the Holy Spirit said the Holy Spirit would come upon you, but this is different. It says now the Holy Spirit is going to come in you. It is going to dwell with you. It doesn't come and go, come and go. You may not hear him all the time because of your relationship with the Father or your situation with sin, but he's there. Always there. And Jesus says, I'm gonna send him to finish the job I started. The very truly I... Uh, I tell you, it is for your good that I going away. Where did he go away? He has gone into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God the Father making intercession for all those he has adopted who've come into the faith. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When Jesus showed up after his death and resurrection, all the disciples are in a room cowering. They're afraid that they're going to be the next ones put on a cross or beaten or flogged. So Jesus shows up. Now they believe in Jesus, and Jesus even told them this was going to happen, but it didn't matter. Something changed in their life that their story continued. And it was at that time. Jesus came and said, guys, I told you. So here's what you need to do. I want you to receive the Holy Spirit. That's the guy I was talking about. The Spirit of Truth. Now, Jesus didn't say, I need you to believe, or I need you to hop on one foot and spin around three times, or I need you to get on your knees, you know, and, and every step on your knees for 100 yards, say a prayer, and the Holy Spirit, he said, the work's done. Receive. Receive it. So I finish this with a story. So people are going, what do you mean receive? What do you mean receive? And the story I made up years and years ago trying to explain this. It's like I'm in my house and I've asked you over for dinner. You knock on the front door. I'm, you know, in the kitchen. I'm doing smoking in the back. And I just yell, come on in. I'll be right up there. Just come on in. You come in and you got this package with you. And you sit down in my living room. My wife calls me and says, hey, what do you think? Are they there? I go, yeah, they're here. Well, what do you think about what they brought you? I go, I, I don't know what you're talking. He said, 
I'm back, I'm still cooking. They're in the house, but I haven't received them yet. I haven't accepted what they brought. The Holy Spirit's in the house or you wouldn't be saved. The question is, have you said, I receive what you've given me, Jesus, to be my advocate here, to finish the job that you started? And it says this advocate will be with us forever. Forever. Did. Have. Do you need to do it again? to receive the Holy Spirit. It's the only way you can keep growing your story. It's the only way you make the story that you have convincing and powerful. A story that's gonna outlive this body to those that you've shared with, that are sharing. You need a testimony with the blood of the lamb. What's your testimony of that blood? What, how has it affected you and been a part of your story? So if you stand with me. And I, I tell you, I, I, um, I pray to God in Jesus' name. But you know what? I also talk to the Holy Spirit. When I need something, I need to make a decision or I need to to enact something here on earth. I need an answer. I need wisdom. I don't ask Jesus. I ask the Holy Spirit because he's right here. I don't have to ascend heaven because he's right here. I receive the Holy Spirit in my life. If you haven't or you need to do it again because, yeah, you've gotten out of the habit. You know, everything's going good. You know, when things are going good, a lot of us forget to talk to our advocate. The one Jesus left behind that looks like him, sounds like him. If the Holy Spirit walked down the aisle right now and you could see him, it would look just like what you think Jesus looks like. They're one. I'm going to surrender. I'm going to hold my hands up before I pray because I surrender. Let me pray for you. Father, we surrender. Some for the first time that we need your spirit. We need the one that you left behind in our life. So we say right now, I receive the Holy Spirit. I receive the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, indwell your people. Speak to them, comfort them, give them wisdom. Drive out the foolishness that's in our heart. Lord, help us to write and keep writing our story that we can overcome the enemy. And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen.